I'm looking forward to to learn from uh, Professor Acosta and uh, and especially because today's um, um, talk sounds very idealistic. So <laughs> looking forward to hearing more about uh, what you um, what you know. Um, your your take and your argument. So let me just hear um, how. So, uh, Professor Acosta, could you yeah, <laughs> come here? Yeah, it's yeah. like I just want to share the screen with you. And this is uh, uh, Professor Acosta. I just want to um, introduce you to the the audience uh, online as well. So let's see. Here is your. Okay. So let's start. Of course, of course. Well, thank you, Gracia. Thanks for you guys to to come in, and also to those of you who are who are online. It's obviously a, a pleasure to be in 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 Tokyo and uh, um, today. Uh, so thanks so much for for the invitation. So as you guys can see, my my talk is about free movement of people, and and it's about how many countries around the world are signing agreements, either bilateral or multilateral agreements, by which they allow nationals of the other uh, ratifying countries to move and reside in their own territory. So this is about free movement of people. And, and this is a new project. So I always welcome, I always welcome obviously ideas, critiques, suggestions, but in this particular case, even more because I'm grappling still with some of the concepts that I will be presenting. So if you have any questions, any critiques, any, any ideas, especially those of you who are coming from different disciplines and my own discipline, uh, those are very welcome. Uh, why am I interested on free movement of people? Uh, so first of all, uh, free movement of people has become very common in the global uh, discourse on migration uh, regulation or on migration governance. Uh, the most uh, clear example of that is Objective 5 of the Global Compact on Migration, which I guess Japan also endorsed. Uh, and under Objective 5 of the Global Compact, it says that the states endorsing the compact uh, should uh, are encouraged to increase uh, and expand the number of bilateral and multilateral free movement regimes. That is under Objective 5, which is about free movement, fa facilitating mobility, okay? Uh, but free movement regimes are not explained. They are not defined. We don't know what free movement regimes mean, right? And we also have other examples. For example, the, the, the African Union, one of the uh, key cornerstones, uh, one of the key projects of the African Union is to have an area in which there is free movement in the whole continent of Africa by 2063. Uh, we have obviously the European Union, which is perhaps the clearest example of free movement, of a functioning free movement regime, but we have also examples in the Caribbean, in South America, in the post-Soviet space, in the Gulf countries, in Central America, in many places around the world, even bilateral agreements that all of a sudden become important. So now in the UK, uh, the bilateral agreement between Ireland and the UK has become very relevant after Brexit, because Brits can only move and reside in Ireland. They have lost, obviously, mobility rights in the rest of EU member states. And Irish are the only EU citizens who can still move to live and work in the UK, right? And that is thanks to a bilateral agreement. We have Australia and New Zealand also as an example of bilateral agreement, uh, Nepal, India. So there are several around the world. And actually, every year, there are new developments in this area. Uh, for example, last year, the Andean Community, which is a regional organization in South America, which includes Peru, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, and Bolivia, adopted a new agreement on free movement of people. And that is interesting because that happened even though there was this uh, period of, uh, obviously, the pandemic. However, in Asia, there are not that many free movement regions. So that is an interesting uh, question to, to discuss a little bit further, perhaps later, right? Um, and uh, I think it's interesting to look a little bit about the history of free movement regimes, free movement agreements, and where do they come from? Uh, and they were actually very common in the 19th century. Uh, they were very common, particularly at bilateral level in the 19th century and early 20th century. Actually, Japan has a bilateral agreement of free movement of people with the Netherlands from 1912, uh, which is still valid, um, although I don't know to what extent it is, it is used, but there are some Dutch colleagues who have been looking at that. And the most uh, known, perhaps, bilateral agreement of free movement of people were the two agreements signed between the US and China uh, in 1858 and 1868, which allowed Chinese to move, reside, work in the US, and um, vice versa. And those agreements uh, um, were very much affected by what is called the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882, which you might have heard about. It was the first time that the US legislated to prohibit 
the immigration of one particular nationality into the US, Chinese, the 19, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, the first time in history. That affected, that had a lot of influence in other uh, important immigrant uh, destinations at the time, particularly in South America, which was the second largest immigrant destination in the world. So countries like Argentina, like Brazil. And, and then later we had some uh, rulings by the US Supreme Court in the late 19th century, also establishing for the first time that countries as inherent in their sovereignty, they had the right to decide who was going to enter and also the right to establish rules on expulsion. So that was the first time that this link, this very clear link between uh, territorial control and sovereignty was established by the US Supreme Court. In any case, 19th century by and large free movement was quite normal. That changes then in a second period, uh, which is the one that we have uh, beginning, as I mentioned, with the Chinese Exclusion Act and these rulings by the US Supreme Court and ending with the Second World War, where the use of the passport and border control become absolutely normal. Uh, and perhaps some of you are aware of the book by Adam McKeon, The Melancholy Order, in which he explains how even countries that were not receiving immigration at the time uh, were somehow forced themselves to establish border controls in order to be considered as a functioning state in the international arena. Uh, then we have another uh, period from 1945 uh, until 1991, I would argue, in which obviously post Second World War, we have the emergence of the individual as a subject of international law, uh, and therefore as a, a, a subject that can also be holder of, of rights. Uh, and obviously we have all the development of international instruments of human rights, uh, but also at the same time, we have uh, certain uh, agreements, again, multilateral agreements on uh, free movement of people, particularly on free movement of workers. Before the European Union, we have Benelux, we have Nordic cooperation, then we have the establishment of free movement of workers in, by the time, the European Economic Community. And then we have uh, other regions uh, in the Caribbean, in South America, ECOWAS in West Africa, also uh, starting to establish free movement regimes. And then there is an outburst after the end of the Cold War. Uh, and some um, um, uh, scholars working on regionalism, they have explained that after the end of the Cold War, the number of regional organizations increased, but also the number of topics that these regional organizations deal with increased. So it is not only about trade any longer, but issues such as migration also appear in the agenda. And within that context, uh, we find ourselves 30 years after the end of the Cold War with a lot of free movement regimes that I have mentioned in many different regions, both at multilateral and bilateral level, but nonetheless, very little academic engagement with these free movement regimes. There, is very few, uh, there are very few scholars interested in writing about how states, basically, they facilitate mobility, rather than about how states make mobility harder through direction of borders which can be obviously legal, physical, digital borders, right? And, and that has to do with an emphasis by many scholars on a pessimistic or perhaps more realistic approach to the governance of migration uh, globally and about, you know, again, how the states are making mobility harder. And you have the, the works of uh, colleagues that you might know, like Agile Sachar or um, Catherine Dauvernier in Canada, for example, or others, you know, writing about how states are making actually the regulation of uh, migration much harder, and how there's this movement towards restrictiveness, which I think tells part of the story. It doesn't tell the whole story. And that is where my project comes in, right? And then there is also a lot of uh, scholars, particularly in Europe, which have quite a particular approach in saying, well, yes, it is true that there are um, glimpses of hope, if you like, in the regulation of migration, and one of them is Obviously, if you are an EU citizen, you are much better off today than you were uh, decades ago because you have free movement, but the EU is an exception. The EU is a very peculiar case that is not replicable uh, in other uh, parts of the world, and therefore they present the European Union as, uh, uh, as an exception. And I find that very problematic, not only for academic reasons, but also for policy reasons, because if you present the uh, regulation of migration globally as being one that is leading everywhere towards restrictiveness, you are uh, presenting also to policymakers uh, fewer policy options to deal with migration. So that is why I think it's very, very important to also concentrate on free movement of people to regimes. So what are the aims of, of this uh, project in which I have started working during the last uh, year more in depth? Uh, 
So there are two initial aims. So the first aim is to understand how can we qualify an international agreement as a free movement of people regime. And I will explain those four terms in a second, right? How do we know when a particular international agreement regulating mobility qualifies as what I label as free movement of people regimes, right? And I will explain that in a second. The second question that this project is looking at is how do we uh, define each of the words in the label free movement of people regime? So what do we mean by free? Why do we mean by movement? Why do we mean by people? And why do we mean by regimes? Because as I mentioned earlier, free movement of people regimes is something you listen quite a lot. IOM repeating the concept quite regularly, global compact on migration, different regions, but nobody has really defined, okay, what do we mean by free? Why do we mean by movement, people, and regions? What is it that each of these terms mean? So this is what I'm doing. This is, these are the two initial aims that I have in mind at the moment, uh, but obviously the project is, uh, what it's doing is to defend a larger research agenda on the development, on the politics, and on the law of free movement of people, a larger research agenda that could lead us to, for example, understand what are the causes behind the adoption of these treaties in many different regions around the world, what are the consequences in practice, how are these regions implemented, uh, do states intend to apply them in practice, or are they an instance of lip service because they want to gain other advantages by ratifying these agreements, and why do we find instances of bilateral and multilateral agreements in different regions and not in others, for example, in, in Asia or in North America, right? And, and finally, how do we square these regions with the parallel rights and importance of walls and fences, which is obviously uh, very clear in the regulation of migration in many countries? So what is it that I am doing, first of all, uh, in order to answer the first question, right, in order to answer this uh, question of what are the conditions to qualify an international agreement on migration as a free movement of people regime? What I am doing is uh, looking at all the agreements that have been identified as being free movement of people agreements by others in the past, both bilateral and multilateral, and I am coding them. I am taking all these agreements, it's around 60 agreements, more or less 30 bilateral, 30 multilateral around the world, and I am coding them, I am systematically coding them with a group of people who are helping me because some of these agreements are in Arabic, in Russian, et cetera. And, and we are looking at, uh, we are coding them since uh, the 1st of January 1992, so after the end of the Cold War, until the 1st of January 2022, okay? We are looking at what is their scope, their personal scope, so who benefits from these agreements, and what is their material scope, so how these agreements change the regulation of entry, residence, rights during residence, and protection from expulsion for those who benefit from these agreements, right? And, and also we want to learn whether these agreements have increased in number since the 1st of January 1992, whether more and more countries are involved in these agreements, and also whether the scope of these agreements have also increased during the last 30 years. So for example, family reunification might not have been included in some of the earlier agreements, is that changing? Is that a new area that is included in these agreements? Okay, so we want to find those three questions. And on the basis of that process, which is already, it's still ongoing, but on the basis of that process, we can already define a free movement of people regimes as those uh, agreements or collections of agreements uh, between two states, regulating migration between two or more states, uh, and offering nationals of each of those states the right to enter, the right to reside, and the right to work in the other state or in the other states which are part of the agreement, okay? So the three key elements in order to qualify uh, an international agreement on migration as a free movement of people regime is that it gives you, as national of one of the participating states, the right to enter, the right to reside, and the right to work in another state party, okay? So this is already different from visa liberalization. Visa liberalization only gives you the right to enter for a certain period of time. And this is also different from labor mobility agreements, which are very common, for example, in Asia. They were also very common in Europe in the past. It's different from labor mobility agreements because a labor mobility agreement only um, offers you temporary residence, usually in another country, and only for certain labor categories that could be you know, agricultural, it could be highly skilled, it could be whatever highly skilled means, because we were discussing that yesterday. It could be, you know, but only for particular categories of workers. 
Free movement regimes are different because if you are a national of one of the participating states, in theory, you have the right to enter, reside, and work in any of the other participating states. Okay, so it's much wider. Okay? So that is the definition of uh, that we're working on on free movement of people regimes. But once we have that definition, what is it that we mean by each of these terms, right? What is it that we mean by free movement, people, and regimes? And here is really work on progress. I'm working on this with a colleague uh, with the legal theories with Jacobo Marti, a colleague of mine in, in Bristol. And we are trying to understand what is meant by each of these four concepts, right? So first of all, what do we mean by free? And the term free ostensibly refers to the freedom that such agreements will give the individual to migrate to another country and the obligation of that country to accept that migration. But such freedom is not an absolute right. We immediately see that free movement of people regimes do not entail open borders. This is not about open borders. It's something different. It's about relaxing the requirements that you have in order to circulate and settle in another country. So uh, countries from a legal perspective, they usually uh, use different tools to restrict mobility and settlement. Uh, first of all, uh, tools which are all barriers. Barriers, for example, that affect entry. You have visas, border controls, etc. Barriers that affect uh, residents. Uh, you have, for example, quotas or residence permits which are tied to one particular employer or, um, you know, or to one particular labor sector or to one particular region. Uh, you have different types of barriers affecting residents, and then you have different types of barriers affecting security of residents. For example, you cannot renew your residence permit after a number of years. I think it's very common in Asia, in many countries, right? For example, Singapore, many uh, labor permits only allowed to reside uh, in, that, in Singapore for two or four years. And after that, you cannot renew the residence permit any longer, right? So uh, barriers that, that are uh, leading to impeding residents of those who, who migrate. So what free movement of people regimes do is not to open borders, but what they do is to reduce these barriers. So they reduce these barriers by getting rid of some of these requirements in order to make migration possible. So it's not about opening borders, it's about reducing barriers. But it's also very important that what we are preliminarily finding is that contrary to what the war free will let us think, these regimes are not a bonfire of rules on migration. They're actually the opposite. They are a proliferation of laws, standards, and processes that operate as a filter to manage migration classes. So it's not that you get rid of the rules, it's rather that you adopt new rules to regulate the mobility of those who fall under the free movement regime in particular, okay? So migration control is still plays a very important role. And this is useful also in terms of policy making. I'm very interested in terms of policy making because when you sell the idea of adopting a free movement of people regime, what many people usually tell you, what many civil servants will tell you, for example, in ministries of interior is, oh no, we don't want that because then we cannot really control who is moving. Actually, what we see uh, empirically from free movement of people regimes is the opposite. You have a lot of rules you know, determining who can move and controlling that movement. So the war free is not, you know, it's not free, it's something different. So that is the first, the first element there. Then what do we mean by movement? I think it is interesting already that these regimes are called free movement of people regimes rather than free migration, right? That tells you already something because it seems that permanent migration is not the goal of these regimes. The word movement tells you something that is much more pendular, right? Much more circular. You move and you come back, you move and you come back, or you move to one state and then you move to another, right? And so it's also important uh, to understand that uh, movement is often uh, related to labor, so to the allocation of work, okay? And also as we are working with this idea that this is transient economic movement that is resisting explicitly because many of these agreements do not offer you the right of permanent residence or implicitly, because even if you have the right of permanent residence, these agreements do not offer you political rights at national level, right? Uh, so these uh, agreements are also impeding interpenetration between the whole society and those who move, okay? And so we're working with this concept of movement, but again, you guys are, some of you are sociologists, so I know there's a lot of literature 
on you know difference between migration, mobility, movement. So if you have any ideas there, that would be very useful. Who are the people, right? That is the, the third question. Who are the people who can benefit from this uh, free movement uh, agreements? And here we find that the people under free movement of people regimes refer to individuals whose identity needs to pass two tests. One test is formal, having the nationality of one of the participating countries, but the other test is substantive, having the capacity to work. Because as I say, most of these agreements are about people who are moving for the purposes of work. And what we're also working is with this idea of uh, how these agreements create a new type of people or a new category of people. And these people is defined by being, first of all, mobile, because they move between the different states where the work is. They are dispersed because they are in different countries. They are variegated because they come from different nations. They are ever-changing because under these agreements, you can move back to your own host state. You can move to another uh, participating state. They are fragmented because it is usually single individuals that are moving. Many of these regimes do not have rules of family reunification, or those rules of family reunification are regulated domestically, and they are fixated in its function. The main function regulated by this agreement, again, is economic, is the uh, allocation of labor. And they are uprooted because the state is only temporal and partial. And I insist, under free movement of people regimes, uh, individuals do not obtain political rights at national level. And this is very important because it means that the only way to obtain political rights at national level continues to be the same manner for all migrants, which is mainly naturalization. And that is in the hands of each state based on how they want to regulate the rules of naturalization, right? And then finally, what are regimes? And here, uh, in particular, those of you who are socialists, I know that there is a lot of literature on, on regimes that we can discuss. We are you know, these are initial ideas, as I said, it's a really, really work in progress. From a legal point of view, regimes, um, the idea that I'm working on is that this refers to a special regimes. And a special regimes under international law are the ones that you have uh, defined in the, in the slide. Uh, but basically, this comes from the idea of international law as being fragmented. There is not one single treaty regulating international migration, right? You find the regulation of the rights of migrants in many different international treaties, and this is quite common in international law, and it goes back to this idea that international is fragmented, and, and moreover, in the case of migration, there is not a supranational authority regulating migration at global level, right? As you will have, for example, more in trade, like the World Trade Organization, there is no such a thing uh, regulating migration at international level. But from the uh, literature and sociology, we are finding uh, really interesting uh, definitions um, and in particular, I, the, the, the second paragraph that you have there refers to um, how the Dublin regime, the Dublin regime is about um, deciding who receives uh, refugees or where refugees stay in the European Union. And these four concepts about the Dublin regime by, uh, in this paper by Scipioni, uh, saying that the La Dublin regime is um, um, characterized by having low harmonization, weak monitoring, uh, low solidarity and lack of strong institutions, we think that this applies very well to the concept of regimes and the free movement of people regimes. Because many of these agreements or collections of agreements creating a regime of free movement between two or several states have a very little harmonization. They have very weak monitoring. Many times you don't have a, a supranational court, for example, to monitor how the agreement is being implemented. Lack of strong institutions, and that also leads to having low solidarity, also in the sense that those who are moving have many times very difficult routes towards defending the rights, the rights that are enshrined under the agreement. So I can conclude just by giving you one example of a particular bilateral agreement that has become quite important, which is the bilateral agreement of free movement of people between Ecuador and Venezuela. So as you might know, in the last, since 2015, almost 7 million Venezuelans have left Venezuela, and they have moved primarily to other countries in South America. Ecuador and Venezuela had a bilateral agreement of free movement of people under which, on paper, Venezuelans have the right to enter, stay, and work in Ecuador. In the beginning of the displacement of Venezuelans, this agreement was working quite well. 
So Venezuelans will arrive to Ecuador, they will go to the migration authorities, they will apply for this residence permit under the bilateral agreement, and they will obtain it. At one point, Ecuadorian authorities decided not to implement this agreement any longer. And the legal avenues to claim the rights under that agreement have been very, very difficult for Venezuelans in Ecuador. Because you know you have to have a, a migration lawyer who understands, first of all, the value of an international agreement, how you in, uh, introduce or how you put that international agreement within the domestic legal framework. You have to have uh, migrants who know about the existence of that particular bilateral agreement, who have access to the text of that particular bilateral agreement, etc. So this leaves individuals in, you know, the, the concept of regimes uh, leaves individuals in a very um, precarious situation to claim their rights uh, in many occasions. So I just conclude by uh, saying that uh, obviously there are many challenges in working on a project like this one. First of all, the challenge of mapping all the agreements. That is an ongoing uh, process, but as I said, many agreements are only in Arabic. I just received yesterday, for example, uh, several agreements between Tunisia on, and Libya on free movement of people, so, but they are only published in Arabic, so I need to have uh, you know, the researcher who's helping me with, with that. And obviously the challenges of defining what we mean by these four concepts. Uh, but then moving forward, it will be interesting, I insist, to look at why states decide to adopt and ratify these kind of agreements. In 2019, I was involved in the drafting of one agreement on free movement of people by IGAD. IGAD is a regional organization in East Africa. That agreement was adopted in 2020, but it hasn't yet been uh, being implemented. So I still wonder why they wanted to have yet another agreement where uh, you know, they all already have other regional organizations in East Africa with free movement of people regimes. Okay, so it would be interesting to understand why you know policymakers are uh, uh, pushing towards the adoption of more free movement of people regimes. And then obviously what happens at the level of implementation? That would be a very interesting uh, case um, for particular countries. And also, to what extent this kind of agreements could be useful for regions that have not really adopted them, like Asia. Uh, and that would be uh, something that uh, could be very interesting. And finally, what are the normative and theoretical implications, not only for migration, but also for our understanding of the concept of uh, citizenship? So I leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um... <laughs> Costa, I think what we can do is we can just uh, stop sharing and see if uh, there are questions and from both from the floor and also from um, online. So anybody has uh, questions or uh, for those of, of you who are online, if you would like also to turn on the camera, it's not obligation, but if, it would be nice if you also turn on the camera and if you, especially if you have uh, questions. Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, we were not in, introduced. Uh, uh, my name is uh, Maximilian Rem. I'm a PhD student at Deutsche University. Oh, okay. Um, I, I was wondering, uh, you, you were talking a lot about, uh, I think you mentioned 60 yeah. total agreements, yeah. um, bilateral and multilateral, yeah. about half bilateral, half multilateral. Yeah. I was wondering, um, I have the impression that many uh, of these agreements are very um, region specific. So yeah. between neighboring countries, or in the case of the EU, yeah. covering many countries in Europe, but yeah. still very regional. Yeah. Is there any super regional agreement? Yeah. Um, and do you see any prospects of such an agreement? Uh, and if there's not, do you see any prospect of such an agreement ever uh, taking form? Yeah. For example, I, I cannot I cannot realistically see uh, the agreement between the AU and the EU, for example. Yeah for free movement people that yeah. it seems very far away yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah i was just wondering about the super yeah. super regional yeah well that's that. very interesting so historically there have been um agreements between different regions it all depends on how you define region first of all right and region can be anything yeah so uh there was bilateral free movement between france and algeria after the independence of algeria for a number of years there were agreements regulating how algerians could move to france and vice versa how they have the right to enter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You could argue that was the Mediterranean region, <laughs> for example, right? So my, my problem initially, this project was about um, regional agreements, 
And I decided to get rid of regional, first of all, because the compact defines the global compact of migration talks about multilateral and bilateral agreements. And at the end of the day, a regional agreement will be a multilateral agreement. And, and secondly, because of the problems I have in defining what is a region, right? A region could be anything. So for example, in the case of South America, now you have a free movement at regional level, regional meaning South America, but South America was never a region. It was always Hispan America initially to exclude Brazil or to exclude not only Brazil, but yeah. you know, the Guyanas and Suriname, um, but to include Central America, Mexico, and you know, Dominican Republic, Cuba. It was later Latin America to include Brazil. And, you know, so, so, I, so I have this problem with, with region. Um, so once we, 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 we understand that you can define region in different manners, uh, and I certainly agree with you, I wouldn't see it plausible to have a free movement of people agreement between the African Union and the European Union. Uh, but then it's about how, for example, how do you define uh, Europe? And we have seen that through each enlargement, we have started defining Europe in different ways, right? And now, for example, we could even include Ukraine in the future or uh, Moldova or Georgia, which were not in the previous plans, you know, yeah. what it was meant to be a European country for the purposes of the European Union. So I think, yes, they are mostly regional. They are mostly between neighboring countries, regional with, with the caveat of how we find region, right? But they're mostly between neighboring countries. And there are some bilateral agreements. There are some, for example, between the US and some of the Pacific um, islands uh, that used to very close to, to here, actually you know, Micronesia and all those islands. But these are really, you know, what I call bilateral agreements between one country and a microstate. It's also, you know, the case of Spain, Andorra, or Italy, San Marino, or France, Monaco, you know, uh, which have these kind of agreements. So you could argue that that is a Pacific region and the U.S. is part of that region as well, right? But, or you could say, well, these are between the two different regions. But in other words, to your question, more to the point, yes, I think it's between neighboring countries mostly. Um, and, you know, could it be between, you know, uh, there will be nothing impeding, for example, mobility between Central America and South America, or certain Caribbean countries and South America, or certain Caribbean countries and Central America, you know. Um, so, but, but they're mostly between neighboring countries. Historically, no, okay? Historically, you have the China, US, Japan, uh, there was also China, Peru, for example, uh, Japan, Netherlands, uh, et cetera. So historically, uh, it was more related to this idea of all these treaties on uh, friendship, uh, commerce, uh, and trade, that many times included also free movement. But perhaps one more point there, uh, if I may. Uh, after Brexit, there have been many uh, discussions as to uh, why not having a free movement of people living between Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK. And that could that could happen. Those debates so far have been toned down because the UK started negotiating a bilateral agreement on trade with Australia, and uh, very quickly the UK negotiators were the ones to say we are not going to include free movement of people. Although I wouldn't see why that wouldn't be possible, you know, considering that there are a lot of Brits in Australia and vice versa. But that, that couldn't work under the framework of the Commonwealth, right? It, it would it no. would be a separate thing. It would be a separate mm -hmm. separate yeah. yeah. The Commonwealth, the only the only thing that affects migration for, uh, with regards to the Commonwealth is that when you are in another country under the Commonwealth, you're a Commonwealth citizen in another Commonwealth country. In many countries, you get uh, voting rights also at national level. But when it comes to migration as such, it doesn't offer you any privilege beyond that. So, for example, in the UK, if you're a Commonwealth citizen, you can also vote in national elections, which EU citizens couldn't, right, under the free movement of people in. But many Caribbean uh, countries also, they have also voting rights in national elections for Commonwealth uh, citizens. Uh, but when it comes to migration as such, being a Commonwealth national doesn't offer you any, any advantage. In some countries, for naturalizing, also you have a privileged treatment for naturalization purposes. Thank you. Um, other questions? Um, 